Good evening to all of you. I'm honored to welcome you all to the webinar on Introduction to Radio Astronomy, hosted by the Observation Division. My name is Shanta Vijay Singha, and I'm one of the moderators in this event. This webinar will be broadcast simultaneously as a Facebook Live on our social media platforms. We'll be hosting a live Q&A session to answer all of your questions. So please make sure to drop all of your questions and comments to this link into the chat box throughout the webinar. First, let me tell you what SETS is. SETS stands for Students for the Exploration and Development of Space which is a non-profit organization that empowers young people to participate and make an impact in space exploration. SETS helps students to develop their technical and leadership skills by providing opportunities to manage and participate in national and international projects, as well as to attend conferences, publish their work, and develop their professional network. SETS helps students become more effective in their present and future careers in industry, academia, government, and education. SETS is a leading organization that consists of students and young professionals to get experience in astronautics. SETS Sri Lanka was established in September 2018 by Amila Sandun Basnaika and Tilan Harshan. Currently, it governs 16 chapters Currently, it governs 16 chapters, chapters established under it, hailing from 18 government and private universities, as well as separate chapter for school children named SETS Juniors. A wide range of activities are carried throughout the year. SETS Sri Lanka currently operates under seven major divisions, which are Rocketry Division, Robotics and Rover Division, Observation Division, Satellite and IT Division, Biomedical and Earth Science Division, Financial Division, and Media Division. Set Sri Lanka has brought international glory to our motherland as an organization that is run entirely by students and young professional volunteers through projects such as Serendip 1.0, which was Sri Lanka's first scientific high altitude, high altitude balloon. Through projects like these, the organization hopes to collect crucial data which can be utilized for the also competitions as NASA uh, competition as NASA Space Apps Colombo 2021 and Acting Space 2021 will be carried out in the near future. SETS SLTC is the established and registered chapter of SETS Sri Lanka within the Sri Lanka Technological Campus. With a highly motivated student base, SETS SLTC is targeting like-minded individuals to be joined with the program for the beneficial turnover for every party concerned. And now I would like to invite Hansika Gamage to deliver the welcoming speech. Over to you, Hansika. Thank you, Shanta. Very good evening, everyone. As the project chairman of the of the observation division of SETS chapter of SLTC. I have the great honor in welcoming you all to the webinar introduction to radio astronomy. First of all, Mr. Ankit Sharma and Mr. Rohan Shanghai, we warmly welcome you both to the session. Also, I would like to welcome Dr. Nanda Gunavardhana, who is the senior advisor of SLTC. And last time, but not to list of my heartfelt, welcome to each and everyone who are present here to gather knowledge and to make this webinar a success. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you Han very much, Hansi Gamge. I'm Jananath Bandara, the other moderator of this event. Now it's time for the most awaited segment of this webinar. Today we have two guest speakers. So let me tell you, take, uh, take you on a brief introduction about the speakers. First of all, Sri Anikat Sharma. Sri so Anikat Sharma is a mechanical engineer from MIT College of Engineering. He's a senior engineer at ATG Alliance Tire Group. He was a senior engineer at Yokohama, India. 
Currently, he is the project lead for establishing ground station and radio telescope at MIT Pune. He has experience of Raman Research Institute radio observatory as well as Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. Next, I would like to introduce Mr. Ron Shanghai. Mr. Ron Shanghai is a third year mechanical student at MIT World Peace University. With a strong passion for astronomy, he is a technical lead for the upcoming ground station project of Cosmos Astronomy Club. He has been selected by Interverse, Inter, uh, Inter University Center for Astronomy and, and um, Astrophysics for their programs. Without further ado, I cordially invite our guest speaker, Mr. Anikit Sharma and Mr. Rohan Shanghai to address the gathering. Yeah, so the screen is visible, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing. So uh, we start with this uh, webinar of introduction to radio astronomy. Uh, both of us are members of the Cosmos Club, which is a club of uh, astronomy and astrophysics club of MIT World Peace University. And we uh, here uh, uh, do researches on various topics and radio astronomy is one of them. Okay, so Rohan will start with the introduction. Uh, over to you, Rohan, with the introduction of radio astronomy. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ankit Bhaiya. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, SCDS for inviting us for this talk. Uh, I'm deeply humbled. So uh, uh, giving an introduction, uh, I'm uh, currently the project lead uh, at uh, Cosmos, which is our uh, astronomy club. And uh, we have given uh, this lecture now about uh, four times. So, and uh, I hope uh, this will uh, start your journey in the field of radio astronomy. And there are really uh, good things you can do even by sitting at home, uh, which we will be guiding you through in this lecture. So, uh, and we'll be uh, taking uh, the topic of radio astronomy from the start, like from the basics. So uh, there is nothing that you miss out on. So uh, starting with what exactly is the radio astronomy? So uh, when you listen to your radio or uh, use your mobile phone or even watch your TV, uh, what you are doing is essentially you are using a device that uh, receives radio waves, right? So radio waves are nothing but a form of electromagnetic radiation, uh, uh, just like the visible light that you are used to seeing with your eyes. Uh, the difference in radio waves is only that they have a longer wavelength and a low, uh, and they are lower in frequency than visible light, uh, which means they carry uh, less energy, right? Because uh, with the formula E is equal to H nu, where uh, E stands for energy and uh, nu is the frequency. So uh, radio waves are uh, far weaker than uh, this. So we need uh, electric uh, electronic amplifiers actually to help us boost this signal. And uh, any electromagnetic uh, wave uh, with a wavelength greater than uh, one mm actually is a radio wave. So uh, next, uh, can you please go back to the previous slide? Uh, just to show, uh, yeah. So uh, if you can see uh, in this electromagnetic wave diagram, uh, you will see one of the uh, wave is a magnetic field uh, a wave and second is the electric field lines. So uh, together they are at an angle of 90 degree and uh, any distance from uh, crest to crest or trough to trough, uh, you can uh, call it as a wavelength. And uh, it doesn't really matter which one is the magnetic field or electric field. Uh, since they are both at an angle of 90 degrees. So uh, this is what an electromagnetic wave is. Uh, now, next slide, please. Yeah. So here again, uh, just to show it pictorially, uh, you can see that uh, the first wave has a longer wavelength than the second one. Uh, so that means uh, the one with the longer wavelength actually will have a lower frequency and hence it will be low in energy. Uh, uh, while the second one, uh, which has a shorter wavelength, uh, it is bound to have a higher frequency and hence higher energy. And on the right, you can see just some basic formulas, uh, which is the speed of light, which is equal to always the wavelength into the frequency. Uh, since speed of light is always fixed, 
uh, wavelength is nothing uh, then uh, you just like carry out uh, frequency on the other side and you get uh, the formula for wavelength uh, so uh, going ahead uh, next slide please yeah so uh, this is a, a very nice diagram uh, which shows you uh, how uh, the wavelength and the frequency uh, is related to the size of everyday things that we come in contact with as well as the uh, temperature of the body emitting the wavelength uh, you might have come across black body uh, radiation uh, which is usually taught in 11th or 12th standard uh, here in india so uh, and uh, uh, on the uh, top it also shows whether uh, this radiation penetrates uh, earth's atmosphere or not so uh, which is the radio window which i will be uh, uh, explaining after this slide so you can see uh, starting with uh, the first uh, uh, wave which is radio so radio uh, can uh, radio waves are usually like they can start from the size of buildings to actually about uh, size of humans uh, human beings so, and uh, yes they do penetrate earth's atmosphere and uh, then as you go along uh, uh, you have microwave then infrared uh, then visible so visible ranges are of the size of uh, small microscopic uh, animals such as uh, protozoans maybe and uh, then you go towards higher frequency waves uh, uh, like ultraviolet x ray and gamma ray and uh, luckily these don't uh, penetrates earth's atmosphere uh, because these have the tendency to cause uh, cancer in humans so uh, and you can see how it is uh, also related to the temperature of the body is emitting the wavelength so naturally as the wave will have higher energy uh, the body emitting the uh, radio like uh, the body emitting the electromagnetic wave sorry uh, will have a higher temperature so you can see gamma rays is like they are generally emitted by uh, uh, bodies uh, like whose temperature exceeds 10 million uh, kelvins right uh, so next slide is about uh, the radio window so what exactly is a radio window so as i explained only uh, visible light and a uh, few parts of infrared and radio waves uh, penetrates earth's atmosphere so you can see here uh, in this diagram that uh, gamma rays x rays and ultraviolet light is completely blocked by uh, upper atmosphere and that is why we have to send out uh, satellites and uh, like other uh, telescopes out in space uh, so you might have heard of uh, nasa x ray uh, like Ch nasa chandra x ray uh, observatory uh, even hubble uh, so uh, though hubble is in visible range uh, so uh, visible light though is observable from earth and uh, which is why we have uh, like most of our observatories are uh, in visible range again for uh, when you go towards the right you will see that most of the infrared spectrum again is absorbed by atmospheric gases uh, uh, and therefore we again have to go to space to observe them but then again when you come to radio waves uh, they are again uh, like they can easily penetrate earth's atmosphere and which is why we have big uh, dishes uh, uh, which can easily observe which are radio telescopes through which you can easily uh, observe uh, radio waves and again then long wavelength radio waves are blocked so uh, moving ahead uh, why why is there a need uh, to uh, so next slide please uh, why is there a need uh, for radio astronomy why just we can't uh, simply use optical telescopes itself uh, why do we have to uh, like uh, you know observe at longer wavelengths the reason being uh, this photo is a very uh, good description of why uh, radio astronomy is so helpful so you can see the comparison of image taken from optical and radio telescopes on the left uh, so this is an m81 group uh, of galaxies uh, you can see the tidal interactions between them uh, so in the left uh, photo you will see this is a photo taken from an optical observatory and you can see uh, three distinct galaxies right so there is one in the center of one at the like near the top and one at the bottom left corner uh but you if you just observe it in optical you will feel as if uh, these are three distinct galaxies with an, uh, almost zero interaction between them because optical does not show you that 
but uh, when you observe it in radio uh, like the hydrogen distribution within these galaxies you can very clearly see uh, that uh, there uh, that these three galaxies are actually interacting with each other uh, so they are gravitationally bound and uh, they are exchanging mass so uh, this is extremely helpful uh, in understanding uh, how Uh, stellar structures are uh, gravitationally bound and how they interact with each other and this is why uh, radio is so helpful uh, so moving ahead to the next slide this is again a comparison uh, taken from like uh, the difference between using an optical telescope versus a radio telescope uh, so you can see in the first uh, picture of centaurus a you can see that uh, in op so uh, the lobes that you see in rain rainbow colors the uh, coming out uh, like uh, the uh, blue and uh, orange colors so they are actually uh, taken from radio uh, but if you see in optical you will only see the normal image of like a disk shape image but when you observe it in radio uh, you can very clearly see that the galaxy is actually uh, emitting out matter Uh, so this might come from uh, the center like it is coming from the center of the galaxy and, and uh, from this we can find out far more things uh, about the galaxy uh, the radio lobes can tell us a lot about the galaxy now coming to uh, our planetary system itself on the right you can see uh, jupiter when observed uh, invisible uh, on the bottom you will see uh, that it is uh, just a huge planet but if you observe it in radio you will see that it has a very very strong uh, magnetic field around it actually and uh, uh, like it ha also has a very strong gravitational field uh, so uh, uh, which is why actually jupiter has a beautiful and very strong auroras uh, near the poles so uh, radio astronomy gives us much more information it adds on to the information that we have got uh, using optical telescopes and this is why it is so helpful so uh, going ahead uh, uh, with the next slide you will see this is how the uh, our sky looks actually in radio so you will see the uh, the bright emission from the galactic plane uh, which uh, so this is a result of a synchrotron uh, radiation so we'll uh, quickly also go through after this ankit bhaiya will be explaining the different types of emission by which uh, we get radio waves Uh, so uh, 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 here you will see the colors uh, actually represent the uh, distribution of hydrogen in the entire uh, galaxy so where there is darker colors like red uh, uh, and yellow uh, actually represent that there is a higher concentration of hydrogen and uh, the other colors like blue as you go on uh, the hydrogen concentration actually uh, comes down so that is what it represents uh, Uh, moving ahead uh, we now have mechanisms of electromagnetic uh, radiation uh, next slide please bhaiya and uh, ankit bhaiya will be explaining from here yeah thank you um yeah so hello everyone uh, this is ankit sharma from uh, and i would like to explain you about the mechanisms which produce uh, these um, radio waves or electromagnetic waves which we were talking about uh, in the radio range so what all stuffs actually cause this re uh, electromagnetic radiation there are many many different kinds of events that actually take place in the universe which uh, actually you know uh, have such kind of uh, electromagnetic radiations uh, that they throw and we catch through our telescopes actually so uh, in the mid time uh, some participants were raising hands so there is no issue if i move on or someone wants to talk anything uh, about right uh, someone wants to talk anything okay okay no worries uh, i will move on with the presentation so uh when we move on to the mechanisms of electromagnetic radiation uh, we know that there are two specific uh, kind of mechanisms which is thermal and non thermal mechanisms uh, the thermal mechanisms are basically due to continuum emissions from ionized gases uh, 
which is uh, when they ionize, they emit these waves. Some are invisible, some are in radio, different kinds of spectrums all together. We have spectral lines emission from atoms and molecules. So as we know, the transitions in atoms and molecules uh, lead to the spectral line emissions and those stuff. Uh, further, uh, even in the non-thermal part, we have the synchrotron radiation as well as the ma uh, masers. We will go deeper in the next slides in both thermal as well as the non-thermal uh, emission part. Uh, so we have these spectral line emissions from uh, atoms and molecules. So as we know, hydrogen is a key element of the universe. Um, it's very, um, you know, pretty much available everywhere in the universe in different quantities and different, um, you know, uh, areas. So there are two types of um, uh, hydrogen, which we call the ionized and non-ionized hydrogen, which is H1 and H2, uh, which we call. This H1 hydrogen actually, since it's ionized hydrogen, uh, it when uh, enters into the spectral line emission phase, it, it actually uh, you know throws out 21 centimeter uh, wavelength um, electromagnetic radiation, which comes in the radio uh, part. Um, if we calculate that uh, frequency, it's uh, 1420 megahertz and uh, this is a very important uh, uh, factor in radio astronomy because most of the radio astronomy uh, uh, researches are specific to this, this particular frequency 1420. Uh, it tells us, uh, it gives us huge amount of information uh, of the universe. Uh, spe uh, specifically, it tells us the hydrogen uh, gas uh, mass, hydrogen gas locations. Uh, as well as the Doppler shifts, we can measure. We can measure huge amount of informations due to this, and we get lots of informations uh, about it. Since in the previous uh, slides, also you have seen this 21 centimeter or 1420 megahertz frequency uh, radio uh, spectrum views. Right. So let us move on to uh, the. Let us move on to the spectral line. Uh, in atoms so uh, here um, as you see if a hot source um, is out there and the hot source is actually um, uh, you know throwing out the spectral line so there is uh, absorption as well as emission the gases actually uh, take up this energy from the hot source and the thermal energy basically and then they actually uh, go on with the chemical transitions so first they will absorb it so then you have this absorption lines which you can see and then further after some time when uh, the uh, uh, when they actually emit it then you can see the emission spectrum so there is a delay uh, which they cause uh, when there is no hydrogen gas in between there or uh, no type of gas in between uh, specifically there will be a continuous spectrum but sometimes we have this lines uh, which we call it as emission lines as well as absorption lines um, they are specific to their uh, nature uh, and it depends upon uh, the type of gas also uh, then we move on to the non-thermal radiation uh, these non-thermal radiations, um, as we have discussed back then, which is synchrotron radiation as well as maser radiation. Uh, let us go on with the synchrotron radiation and let us understand what it is. So synchrotron radiation is specifically can be uh, explained in a very simple way. When a charged particle enters into the magnetic field, uh, it moves um, in a particular path due to the magnetic line of forces. So it will follow that particular path uh, subsequently. And um, so, uh, then when it follows that particular path, uh, the it causes uh, uh, a radiation, which uh, we, uh, we call a form of cyclotron radiation, uh, called a synchrotron radiation. Such type of synchrotron radiations are used in many uh, man-made uh, researches also to research the um, uh, basic electromagnetic radiation part, the nuclear researchers, many times they use this synchrotron radiation to actually generate uh, electromagnetic radiations and then study over it. So you will hear this term quite often when you study physics. Such radiations are also available from the universe. 
because they are natural synchrotrons. Um, then we have uh, the MESERS. MESERS stands for Microwave Application uh, Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. So since you know lasers, which is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, if you drag this laser approach into the microwave approach, it, it forms MESERS. So MESERS are microwave application by uh, stimulated emission of radiation. It's very simple to understand, uh, similar to how lasers actually have. There is a DX, uh, de-excitations and uh, plumping as well as de-excitations, uh, which leads to this particular uh, major, uh, major formations and major emissions. So uh, uh, masers are very compact sites within molecular clouds where emissions of certain molecular lines can be eno enormously amplified. So uh, basically it is a type of emission, stimulated emission by uh, some clouds. So it comes in the non-thermal part. Uh, then we move on to specifically the radio telescope. Uh, radi uh, since we have studied from what is basically radio waves, uh, we have studied from which events actually they come towards us in the universe, which events actually result in radio uh, waves to come towards us. We will now move on to how to receive them and how to actually go on uh, with the research phase. So this is very important for all of you uh, who are uh, in the meet. And uh, uh, what is a radio telescope? So uh, basically, um, this particular picture is of GMRT, and, which is Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. And uh, a radio telescope is a specialized antenna or a radio receiver, basically. So uh, we all use antennas in our day-to-day -day life. We have Tata Sky antennas, or uh, in India, there is Tata Sky there. It may be something else. So there is this dish antenna kind of a thing, which actually uh, uh, you point it towards the satellite, and then you can receive the data from the satellite or uh, the informations from the satellite. You can uh, communicate with satellite using antennas. So likewise, when you actually don't receive from a satellite, but you receive from universe itself so when you receive from universe itself you uh, are receiving this um, uh, your actually antenna becomes a radio telescope but it's not that uh, simple to make a radio telescope as it is simple to make a, uh, a ground station or an antenna reception system from the satellite because these waves are very delicate the radio um, emissions uh, when they reach earth they are very delicate and uh, if they are very delicate, uh, you need many amplification devices, as mentioned by Rohan previously, and uh, you need a specific setup which is very sensitive towards uh, these such uh, radiations. That's why you see big, big uh, telescopes all around. But uh, don't worry about um, you know you spending lots of money on this big telescope. You can even do researches uh, without. Uh, the use of this big telescopes. It is a new project which we will be coming up with and I will be explaining you later on, All right? Um, so we have uh, two uh, great scientists, uh, Mr. Jansky and uh, Mr. Reber. So uh, Mr. Jansky were, was uh, the one who actually uh, uh, brought in radio astronomy field totally. He was the pioneer of radio astronomy as we see. Uh, so he used his antennas, which you can see on the left hand side above, Jansky antennas to research uh, about it. And uh, when you go on the right hand side, you will see Reber. Over a decade of time, Reber was the only uh, uh, you know, radio astronomer in the world, over a decade. And he actually used his wish to uh, get uh, the radio uh, from the universe, uh, the radio emissions from the universe, and then study it subsequently. Um, we have this uh, working of, uh, you know, dish antennas, how they actually work. Uh, when you have a single dish, uh, it works in such a way that first you have the radiation, which comes on the dish, 
and then uh, the dish is actually a reflector a parabolic or maybe of any shape it depends on what kind of antennas and what frequency you are viewing but uh, it is a reflector and reflects to a focal point and then that particular fo focal point receives it uh, totally uh, and that particular receiving actually goes on with the signal processing units. So your signal processing unit may have numerous amplifiers, may have numerous uh, mixers, um, which actually changes the frequencies and uh, do, uh, does that correlation uh, stuff. And then we have a different frequency then which is auto-correlated. So this is basically for those telescopes which are located away, way away from the um, computer or uh, the systems basically so then uh, once you change the frequencies uh, that frequencies can be transmitted that frequencies will be of higher power and can be transmitted over a longer distance so likewise you have this particular setup uh, which we further you have this range interferometry so likewise you have seen there are numerous and numerous of antennas which are connected together so how they are connected to the how they can function simultaneously at the same time the reason behind that is radio interferometry radio interferometry is specifically uh, a set of radio antennas which we call it as a radio array so these arrays are connected with each other in such a way that they correlate they cross correlate and correlate to give a single output that single output uh, can be of various polarizations, can be of various natures, can be of uh, can, uh, but they are specifically from a single part of the sky. So when you uh, view a single part of the sky uh, with a numerous amount of telescope, you will need radio interferometers or radio interferometry to actually uh, mix them up and give you a single uh, part. Many times, uh, this particular um, radio interferometer is used to get uh, beautiful radio images. Likewise, we see uh, using optical telescope. If you see, if you wish to see using radio telescopes, uh, I mean the radio images, then you need this uh, radio interferometer or array setups with you. Now, this is a particular project which uh, we are working on. Um, uh, Rohan, me, and uh, uh, many in Cosmos are working on this particular part. It, uh, what we call it is uh, affordable small radio telescope. Now, since we all cannot have big, big dishes, we all cannot have, uh, you know, such uh, heavy investments. Uh, we have this particular setup, which is very simple and uh, which each and every one of you can actually build at home. It's a uh, like you have uh, small telescopes with you, the observable telescopes. Likewise, we have tried to bring the same concepts in radio. We can have a small uh, radio telescope right at your house. Uh, it can it basically needs a, a dish antenna, small satellite dish antenna, which you you can get it for receiving TV or TVB setups and those stuffs. Then you will need a satellite finder, which also you can get uh, get easily in any electronic store. Uh, it is commercially used for the TV setups. And uh, you will need a mechanical stand for mounting the antenna that you can build also from scrap. Uh, we generally build from scrap, but you can get it at store also. Then the cost of the project is approximately 3000 INR, which is Indian rupees. You can convert it into uh, the Sri Lankan way. Uh, but it's very cheap and each and everyone, uh, most of us can, uh, you know, uh, at least the institutions can actually uh, afford it. And uh, it can be further improvised using RTL SDR. So um, RTL SDR is in these software defined radios, which we have been using for various purposes. Uh, th this can be incorporated, but then it will increase your budget uh, to approximately 10,000 Indian rupees. So uh, this is a uh, affordable small radio telescope approach, which uh, we have got and we have uh, studied uh, many uh, areas, specifically the planetary radio emissions we have studied uh, and also the solar radio em emissions we have studied using this particular uh, setups. Uh, there are uh, some famous radio telescopes which I would like to inform you about, which is uh, GMRT, Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope in India. It's in Kodad, uh, Maharashtra itself, and uh, very near to both of us, actually, uh, me and Rohan. 
then we have vlba which is very long baseline array which is in the usa we have lofar antenna which is low frequency array so this particular uh, frequency uh, this uh, they approach uh, at about 50 megahertz to 500 megahertz which is on the lower range of frequencies uh, we have uh, a upcoming mega project which is uh, mostly developed uh, and will be in the developing phase in 2021 which is sk which is a square kilometer array it is spread uh, over the world actually since radio interferometry is a big thing and they can actually correlate millions and millions of telescopes so they have done this particular thing and which they have used square kilometer array but uh, it's mainly based in south africa and australia but india is also a part of square kilometer array mostly uh, then we go on with uh, the gmrt uh, which is giant meter wave radio telescope uh, you can see uh, the 30 dish locations on the left hand side below you can see the orientation of it it's in a y shape so it's not a random shape actually this uh, y shape is specific to its nature because uh, this particular uh, you know uh, radio telescope when arranged in this particular y shape it is equivalent to that bigger circle so when you see that particular bigger circle which is um, approximately uh, uh, you know uh, 30 dish combining together to make a bigger uh, specific uh, dish together so uh, uh, it is uh, a very big uh, area and it uh, is also a sanctuary together so nature is also preserved uh, specifically uh, giant meter wave radio telescope has 30 fully steerable dish of 45 meter diameter which is very huge and several bandwidth in the range of 150 to 1500 megahertz uh, it is the second largest telescope in the world uh, specifically and uh, a major synthesis radio telescope it has uh, named many discoveries to its name and uh, uh, it is the largest telescope at meter waves. So, uh, yeah, that's an uh, amazing telescope of, of its kind. It's located in India itself. Uh, we have this VLBA telescope, which is a single dish telescope. But again, this particular dish is very huge. Uh, and we have uh, uh, it at various areas in US states. Uh, so, likewise, you can see it is in Hawaii, Washington, California, Arizona. Mexico, uh, in New Mexico, Mexico, Texas, New Hampshire. So it's in USA totally uh, using the phenomena of uh, radio interferometry together. We have this low far antenna. So you want, you might be wondering, there is no dish out here, actually. So it's not necessary that you need a dish to actually um, receive a radio waves. You may not. Uh, receive it using dishes you can receive it using uh, flat antennas also so here you can see patches of antennas actually so these antennas are also very specific to its nature and they are very sensitive uh, it consists of vast vast areas of omnidirectional antennas actually and uh, the main uh, use of omnidirectional antennas is it can view from all directions it can receive from all directions and uh, uh, they are uh, antennas are digitized transported to central digital processors uh, the electronic electronic signals basically and then they are combined in a software uh, to emulate a conventional antenna of a bigger size so, which is radio interferometry specifically so, this is low far and uh, the next big step is the ska step which is square kilometer A, which is under development. Uh, it will be completed in two phase between uh, 2018 and 2020, but due to the pandemic phase, it has been delaying a bit. Uh, so in 2021, it will be completed mostly. And we have this particular uh, uh, location in South Africa and Australia, majorly in the deserted regions it is, uh, because the, uh, you can actually utilize that particular region for radio astronomy part. There are different types of antennas uh, included in this particular thing. And as you see, 2000 high and mid frequency dishes, which are big dishes uh, and aperture arrays, uh, which we have 
10 raised to 6 low frequency antennas. So 10 raised to 6 is a huge number. So uh, all these antennas are connected together to uh, using radio interferometry softwares, uh, data interpretations, and then you can actually use all these antennas at a single point of time to receive signals from the universe. It's a big thing and a big project. So uh, then we go on to major sources of radio waves in the sky. So there are many major sources of radio waves since we have uh, discussed the events. Now let us move on to the sources of these particular events, right? So we, we have major sources as radio galaxies, quasars, blazars, uh, Stafford galaxies, uh, Jupiter system, you have already seen Jupiter system um, uh, and uh, uh, you have seen the picture actually, the 21 centimeter picture of the Jupiter system, it's uh, quite impressive. Then we have uh, star sources, which is variable stars, uh, which actually, uh, you know, changes irregularly uh, variable stars and the binary stars actually, and then we have pulsars and we have our sun. So pulsars are basically rotating neutron stars. They emit from uh, both their poles. And um, in the galaxies part, we have the radio galaxies. You can see this, um, you know, uh, pictures which specifically demonstrate the radio visions of a radio galaxy. So this particular part is a radio galaxy. We have Stafford galaxies, which um, actually can only be seen uh, totally in radio spectrum so uh, you can see they have these uh, gases on the uh, rim uh, totally and then we have quasars quasars are very distant and radio becomes a very important source to actually visualize a quasar because they are very distant to us and they may be uh, visibly not uh, that efficient to be seen but using radio you can actually see it at a very amazing uh, clarity. So here you can see the quasars part and then we have the blazars part uh, which also in the radio you can see. We have this planetary sources and uh, their satellites. Um, so here you can actually see uh, how Jupiter behaves for um, or interacts with the solar winds. So you can see many um, you know impacts of solar winds on planets or many impacts which actually you cannot see with the uh, observable um, telescopes and stuff so these are on in the electromagnetic frame uh, the these are beyond our capability of eyes but we can see it using uh, the uh, you know uh, radio eyes of ours which are radio telescopes so we have this solar blockages that uh, is formed by the magnetic field lines of Jupiter, the interaction between the Jupiter's magnet of sphere and the solar waves. And uh, we should be thankful to Jupiter for that. Uh, we uh, have this uh, electric current or the invisible ring of Jupiter, uh, which can only be seen in uh, the radio uh, spectrum part. You have already seen it in the previous uh, radio picture of Jupiter, specifically Rohan has explained it quite impressively. We have the star sources. Uh, so here uh, you have this um, uh, sun's view, uh, we, which we can see the um, uh, radio pattern uh, specifically, um, you know, demonstrating the dark spots where uh, the solar flares are actually flaring out um, and also on the right hand side we can see the pulsar uh, beams and uh, radiation beams that the uh, rotations and radiation beams of the pulsar likewise and these pulsation of pulsars can easily be seen very clearly in the radio spectrum uh, we have uh, so we since we have done various researches in the radio field, we have few amazing observations in the radio field, which I would quickly uh, like you to know. We have this uh, sun sweep. Sun sweep is very uh, specific. Uh, what we do is we sweep, uh, keeping the sun in the mid, and we sweep it, sweep our telescope 180 degree uh, throughout. 
so when when you do this sweeping you get a gaussian curve uh, which is the sun sweep curve uh, it's specific to its nature and you get many informations about sun at that particular time using this particular gaussian curves uh, we have, we are now going to give you two live demonstrations specifically one is the pictor telescope so it is an online telescope about what they do is they connect uh, this telescope via web site uh, we can uh, use this particular telescope we can book our sessions and use it for pictor you may not book your session but for uh, the salsa telescope which is such, such a lovely small antenna it's a small antenna but they are quite effective in nature and uh, few many of our researches are being done using uh, the salsa telescope uh, so uh, we will be having a quick demonstration of these two telescopes uh, and then we will go on with the observations using this salsa telescope so rohan will be presenting now and they will be uh, getting uh, getting a live uh, demonstration of uh, how to use a radio telescope which is uh, available to us uh, using the internet uh, right from our home basically so yes uh, rohan over to you can you screen share your part uh, yes thank you bhaiya uh, i'll share my screen and uh, so first we'll be going through uh, the pictor radio telescope which is in greece so uh, it is free for all to use and it is a very handy tool uh, to learn radio astronomy uh, so i'll be guiding you through their website after which uh, we'll move on to uh, salsa uh, which as we already uh, told you the full form which is uh, such a lovely small antenna uh, so it is based in uh, sweden and you can uh, book it as well and uh, it is a very uh, 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 an advanced uh, instrument uh, which you can freely use uh, by sitting at your home uh, to even do uh, wonderful radio astronomy related uh, experiments at home so uh, let's start uh, is my screen visible uh, yes it's visible bro okay okay so uh, the website name here is uh, pictortelescope.com uh, Uh, uh so bhaiya can you please type it out in the chat box for uh, others if they want to see uh, so, surely, uh, surely 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 yeah so you can uh, go here and learn more about how to use this telescope uh, but i'll quickly show you how to do that the specifications are given uh, about the telescope what is the frequency uh, how what is the length and uh, all other things so you just have to go here and observe right and uh, once you go to observe uh, so it will show you uh, so here if you are it says if you are new to radio astronomy you can simply click here and it takes you to we'll again talk about the same basics that we have explained to you so actually i have taken few things from here itself so uh, what all can you observe so it, this is a very helpful guide uh, which you can use and then uh here once you uh, go to the website so you will see that uh, it says uh, the telescope is currently pointing 1 degree from the zenith so uh, this is a non movable telescope uh, this does you cannot move it uh, whereas salsa the next one that which we are going to use uh, uh, is an advanced version so that one you can actually move uh, by sitting uh, at your home and operating it so uh, let me just uh, name my observation so i'll uh, name it probably scds uh, talk right and uh, so center frequency uh, is uh, the frequency at which uh, we would like to take our observation so 1420 as uh, bhaiya already explained is the uh, uh, frequency of uh, h1 line so that is where uh, you get uh, the neutral hydrogen uh, line uh, and uh, bandwidth is just the uh, how, how how varied you want the signal so you can leave these uh, things just as it is if you want uh, uh, and once you read the guide you will be even uh, quite clear with what is bandwidth a number of channels and number of bins uh, i don't think i'll be able to do justice uh, to it if i uh, it will take quite a lot of time to go into it so duration uh, as you uh, so this uh, takes a duration of maximum of about 500 seconds 
so uh, let me just uh, give a 10 second uh, duration here and uh, the best thing about this is you can receive your data as a dot csv file as well so as you know dot csv file is very helpful uh, when you want to use python uh, to analyze it so you can use uh, libraries such as numpy or uh, pandas to uh, use the csv file and do all sorts of calculations with it so uh, this is very helpful uh, but the only problem being uh, you cannot actually change the location of the telescope so uh, one helpful way is to use Stellarium, uh, take it to uh, Greece. Uh, I think the location, exact location is given as well. And uh, once you go there uh, from Stellarium, you can actually see what part of sky it is pointing since it is given uh, one degree from the zenith. So you can type it uh, in Stellarium, uh, the, uh, the part at one degree from the zenith, and you'll see uh, what part of the sky uh, this telescope is pointing at. So that way, uh, I think it is helpful. And if you type out your email address, so let me just do that and uh, hit submit. So what is just that it says that your observation request has been successfully submitted. Once the observation is carried out, you will receive an email. So if there are no observations uh, lined up, it will uh, automatically start your uh, observation and uh, you will uh, you will get the data in your email. So uh, I'll just open up my email and uh, we'll check if I have received it or not. Yeah, uh, we'll just wait for two minutes. I think uh, it will get it. So uh, till then, uh, I'll move on to Salsa. Uh, so Salsa website again, uh, let me just, okay, there is a login page. I think it logged out. So yeah, Salsa on Sala. So uh, this is the uh, Salsa website. Uh, uh, again, uh, I'll put out the link, uh, but yeah, you can put it in the chat box for others. And uh, there are QR links at the end, so we'll share the PPT. So uh, don't worry about the resources. So here you will find- You can also take screenshots, likewise. Yeah. Uh, so uh, here you will see uh, uh, the complete introduction. Uh, so this is a small, uh, these are two small on Sala Space Observatory and uh, you can either book both of them or a single one and they have their own names as well. So uh, the right one is break and one is called whale. Uh, in Swedish, they mean something, I hope, uh, but uh, I don't really know the uh, meaning as of now. So uh, going ahead, you can make an account and book your session, which I've already done. And uh, there is a live webcam as well. So let me let me just check if I have got the email first. Yeah. yeah uh, so I have received the mail. So this is how your data comes out. Uh, so first, it will give you all the data uh, that what was the observation time. The center frequency was about one four two zero. Uh, near, so 1419 uh, uh, megahertz and uh, the bandwidth and everything that we had put out and the duration as well and the id is also there so once you open the png uh, you can see that there is a dynamic so this gives a dynamic spectrum as well uh, which is the like waterfall spectrum uh, this was the average uh, spectrum that it shows and uh, once you read the guide uh, you will be able to uh, make sense of this complete chart uh, in Salsa, this is much easier. So let me show you uh, the observation there. I think that is much easier to grasp uh, as of now. So uh, uh, going to Salsa again. Uh, so this is the live camera that they have. As you can see, uh, here is a left dish and this is the right dish. And we have booked both of them today. But actually, one of them is under maintenance. And due to the COVID situation in Sweden, uh, they told me that uh, they won't be able to uh, mint, uh, like repair it today. So we'll be using break, uh, which uh, as you can see, uh, I'll uh, once I start uh, operating it, uh, you can see it moving in, in live time. So 
uh, let me just go here. Yeah. So let me type my password in. Yeah. So this is how the interface looks. You can see a uh, salsa controller wheel and uh, these are so target you can select here, right? Uh, either you can like select it uh, galactic plane or uh, uh, you can select uh, 140 zero or you can select the sun. So uh, let me just select uh, the time as sun. And uh, once you hit go, it is going to uh, go at the tracking uh, position. And uh, we'll see here that the telescope will now move. So uh, if you can see uh, the telescope is slowly moving. Uh, I hope everyone can see, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the left telescope is actually moving and it will now uh, track the sun, right? So uh, this we are out actually operating in live time. Uh, this is not recorded. So currently it is about 12:32 uh, uh, in uh, Sweden, which is a UTC time. And uh, once uh, it has uh, started tracking, uh, here it will show you that it is tracking. Uh, and uh, then what you can do is uh, here in the advanced section again. Once you go through the Salsa's user manual you will understand uh, what object you want. Uh, you can set everything, uh, the desired, uh, like uh, cal uh, what uh, altitude and azimuthal uh, uh, points that you want. And here in advance, you can again set the frequency. So let me just change it to uh, 1420. Uh, keep the bandwidth as it is. Uh, and all, everything uh, that you see here, uh, you will be under, able to understand it better once you read the guide. So surely do that if you want. And uh, then here going to basic, uh, let me just again take a, a 20, uh, 10 second. Uh, so integration time just means the time, uh, like for how long do you want to take the signal for? So uh, I'll hit on measure and uh, it will start taking the uh, spectrum. So here you will see, so it has started collecting uh, radio waves from the sun. And uh, now I think it has done that. So here, as you can see, uh, so it has taken uh, the data and uh, the peaks that you see uh, uh, at near the zero is uh, where you have actually found the hydrogen line. So because we have taken it for just 10 seconds, uh, the graph is not smooth. Uh, but uh, if you go uh, to the slide, so we have already taken a few observations uh, beforehand. So here, if you see, uh, you can see uh, this is the uh, observation that we have taken of the nebula Castopia A. And you can see uh, three uh, major peaks here. Uh, and uh, here, as you can see, so this is the first peak, the second one, and the third one. So uh, these represent uh, hydrogen that you have uh, received from the Castopia A nebula. So this is how the nebul uh, nebul uh, nebula looks. And uh, and the peak, uh, the off shift of the peak from zero uh, that you can see here actually represents the Doppler shift if you are familiar with it, which is uh, if the uh, nebula is going going away from us or coming towards us. So the red shift and the blue shift can be calculated with this very easily. So uh, Salsa is a great tool uh, to learn uh, basics of radio astronomy at least and you can do uh, quite fun experiments with it so uh, i think uh, that is it uh, that i i wanted to show and uh, going ahead uh, these are the uh, references uh, the links and the qr codes and uh, so this is for the affordable small radio telescope manual uh, that you can use to make your own radio telescope at home. As I already explained, it is uh, quite easy and uh, cheap to make. Uh, so this is the link, uh, it is clickable. And uh, this is the manual that uh, I had uh, used in my first year uh, to start with the basics of uh, introduction to radio astronomy. It is made by NASA itself. So it is quite detailed. Uh, so I'll be sharing the PPT link itself and you can uh, go over to these. So this is about a 110 page long uh, PDF and it should uh, give you all the uh, knowledge uh, necessary to start with uh, your experiment uh, uh, experimentations in radio astronomy, I believe. 
because at least it was uh, enough for me and uh, this is the link to pictor uh, which we uh, recently used the telescope in greece and uh, i think that is it from my side if ankit bhai you want to add anything uh, please do so yeah uh, rohan specifically have explained everything uh, quite uh, beautifully um, from my side only i would like to uh, say that um you you please do uh, since radio astronomy is the new upcoming field uh, majority of the discoveries in the optical field are totally uh, exhausted and presently radio is the burning field where you get majority of uh, research is majority of discoveries uh, specific um, and uh, also even the recent discovery of black hole Uh, the picture of black hole actually uh, which they have actually created uh, using overlapping many uh, researches over a brief period of time so that particular thing was also uh, using the radio astronomy part uh, included in it so it is that uh, efficient um, and we encourage all of you all of our participants out here to venture into this particular field and enjoy uh, the nature of this radio world around us thank you thank you mr mr anikit sharma and rohan shanghai for sharing your valuable knowledge with us i hope you all enjoyed the session next up it will be the live q and a session you could all simply put your questions in the google form using the link in the chat box the first question is as our universe is expanding so we suffer red shift Are radio waves also suffer Doppler effect? If yes, then how we know the actual radio waves emitted by the galaxies? Uh, yeah, uh, Rohan, can you go on the PPT part? Uh, yeah. Can you yeah. present the PPT? Yeah, I'll just show that. It's a very interesting question, and uh, I would be very eager to actually answer this particular thing. Uh, uh here on the uh, cassiopeia a observation um as you can see the peaks are actually shifted the peaks are actually shifted towards the right uh, which gives us a impact of the red shift um the left one is the blue shift and the right uh, right side if they are shifted they are red shift means they are moving away from us but uh, specific to its nature as you can see we should receive the um, uh, uh, all the radiations at 1420 which is 00 uh, in this particular graph but we aren't receiving at 00 we are receiving at a different frequency with, uh, so this shift in frequency is the doppler shifting which we have been talking about and this is the major factor for giving us many informations including the um, speed including their positions and many other informations of uh, the particular uh, you know object or the particular gas uh, or cassiopeia specifically in this particular case the hydrogen in cassiopeia hydrogen globules in uh, cassiopeia uh, specifically so yes uh, they do do uh, observe doppler shift and it's the major source of information which gives us uh, how they behave actually out there so yeah this is uh, the actual uh, uh, thing uh, rohan you want to add something uh no no uh, i think that is uh, a very good explanation and a very good question as well so once you start reading uh, the nasa jpl uh, pdf on introduction to radio astronomy uh, they explain it beautifully uh, uh, the doppler shift and uh, how to subtract it so uh, i think you should start reading that and uh, you will understand how uh, it works Uh, thank you very much sir there's another question from one of our participants if we observe light coming from a quasar which behind a giant dark matter we observe einstein's ring or einstein's cross if we observe the quasar using radio astronomy to observe how would it be seen yeah rohan uh, will you be answering this particular part uh yeah so uh what i think uh, uh, uh the question talks about gravitational lensing uh, 
coming from theory of relativity so uh, of course uh, so gravitational lensing is a concept where the light bends uh, where, where there is a heavy matter uh, the like so for example here consider this cassiopeia a as a a uh, dense uh, matter you know, with high gravitational field and the light coming behind it it will bend in such a way that uh, you will see two images actually of the thing that uh, is behind it so uh, with radio as such you don't get an image uh, you construct an image right so and uh, i think we forgot to mention that uh, every radio telescope gives you only one pixel so uh, uh, in gmrt as you know there are about uh, how many 30 uh, telescopes right so uh, each telescope is giving you only one pixel of the image and uh, that is why they take multiple observations to construct that image and uh, so that image should be similar to what you see in optical but uh, mm -hmm. uh, like it should only the change will be that you will see the uh, so if you are observing at 1420 uh, it is going to sh show you the hyd hydrogen distribution and definitely uh, the radio waves are also going to bend around that matter Uh, since uh, 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 because it is electromagnetic radiation as well, but I, I think that's a very good question, and I'll have to look into it as well because I myself have never seen uh, gravitational uh, gravitationally lensed uh, radio images. Uh, so I'll search and uh, get back to you. Uh, you have my email ID. So yeah, I would like to add uh, to the Rohan's explanation. uh gravitation lensing actually uh, does impact uh, the radio observations but as you see radio observations are in terms of graphs graphical nature and um, as rohan rightly mentioned only one pixel of it is observed at a particular time since we are concentrating on uh, to that particular area so when you construct a image uh, specific to uh, the radio part you construct only a small part of it and not a very large part of it first of all and you will first uh, examine the graphical nature of it and then you will construct an image so uh, the lensing specifically won't be seen uh, very uh, as a big subject because it can be easily caught in uh, the uh, gravitation i mean in the graphical nature and you can easily rectify it uh, specific to its nature so uh, it doesn't play a big role in the radio nature but yes it does play a big, big role in the observable astronomy nature that's all from this uh i want to know how distance correlation is done i was doing with uh, solar imaging radio astronomy and imagine solar radiation peaks in terms of beam with using gaussian and heat mapping currently i am currently struggling with distance correlation with solar radiation plot obtained yeah so uh, distance for the geometry uh, of your uh, uh, you know a uh, system basically so whatever system you are viewing on let it be a solar let not be a solar system uh, it doesn't matter but you have to go through the geometric correlations you have to construct your triangular systems and uh, likewise you have to abstract uh, the information from it uh, the salsa manual which rohan has been talking about have specific formulas of it uh, to illustrate the distance correlation rohan you want to add something to it uh no no way yeah i think uh, once like uh, for distance correlation once you go through the salsa manual uh, they explain it very well and uh, you should be able to apply that after that yeah so you might be searching in on one of our salsa telescope salsa on sala telescope links you will get your answer right away it's straight forward to its nature Thank you very much sir there's another question will the radio waves emitted by artificial sources in earth interact with the telescope if so uh, will the data be disturbed yeah. so uh, definitely they interact 
but what you can see is uh, most of the telescopes are uh, very um, uh, you know they um, the, these particular dishes are for that particular reason they only concentrate on a specific part of the sky we call them as the beam width of the telescope so they actually concentrate on a very small part of the sky and they actually neglect or i guess the telescope ignore the other radiations in the surroundings Uh, it will interfere with the telescopes that's why that's why majority of our major telescopes are in secluded regions where there there is very less uh, extra radiations like forests sanctuaries where the extra radiations or the metropolitan radiations what what we say the mobile towers and all those stuffs are very less so it don't interfere with the signals uh, likewise uh, there was a uh, you know case which i would like to say uh there was this particular uh, big dish which was um, uh, getting a constant signal uh, straight throughout uh, and when the researchers actually digged deep into it it was a signal from their microwave oven <laughs> right in the uh, facility itself so yeah it does interfere but we uh, due to the advancements in technology and uh, we when we narrow down the reception beam width or uh, we only focus at that particular area from which we need and we ignore other areas electronically anything rohan you want to add uh no i think you have covered it well so there are there is actually uh, a lot of uh, post processing that goes on as well so uh nasa okay so uh, there is a lot of post processing that goes on uh, with this and uh, uh, so if you uh, are able to visit uh, gmrt uh, they actually show you the data centers uh, where they uh, do this so they minus uh, like they subtract the noise uh, that you get uh, from outside to actually get the pure signal and uh, there is a lot of uh, like there are electronics as well which help you subtract that so for small radio telescopes you can even use like a low noise amplifiers like which we are uh, currently buying for our ground station that we are building so uh, yeah thank you sir another question is uh, universe is having different types of radiation as well as fields which aren't identified yet how we will identify that those are affecting our signals in space uh it's very easy uh, uh when you receive the signals if you receive any interferences or if you receive any distortions which are not specific to its nature or which aren't uh, you know relating with anything in the uh, surrounding then you can comment on it hmm. when you actually uh, uh, like if you go on uh, to research the dark matter theories when you actually plot the rotation velocity of milky way curve which we have uh, done using salsa uh, radio telescope so when you plot this curve you can actually see that uh, even on the uh, outer side outer uh, part the velocity is very high uh, but by the kepler's equation it should not be very high so you can actually see the correlations of dark matter and why this theory actually exist you can know that so uh, yeah definitely you have to study the interferences as well as the anomalies to actually see the correlationship between these extra um, anomalies basically which aren't explained by science till now excuse me sir so uh, there's a special question here so as yes. uh, said sltc we are happy to say that we have uh, built our own radio telescope using uh, the thing a is a uh, thank you and uh, the thing is uh, we do receive a lot of signals now so how do we use i mean how do we make um, a sky map using the data that we received so uh, sky map is basically uh, mapping huge uh, data sets together in the sky so you have to receive from different different parts of the skies simultaneously uh, and specifically uh, you have to map you have to uh, also take a account of from where you are absorb, uh, observing the information and uh, when you connect this in, information together 
totally uh, like you are uh, receiving from a particular part of the sky and then uh, you note down that yes you are getting uh, 21 cm you are not getting 21 cm you are getting flat line you are getting something else so that you have to map and all these graphs you have to show it in a dynamic spectrum so when you show everything in a dynamic spectrum you will get an image uh, which will specifically illustrate each and every pixel will specifically illustrate their uh, particular point or their particular um, you know information so likewise if you take 100 uh, 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 observations of different parts of skies and you will plot it you will get a 100 pic- pixel uh, image uh, and if you go with the 1000 then you will get 1000 uh, pixel image uh, and likewise you can go 10 is to 6 you get 1 megapixel image so likewise it depends upon the number of observation you won't take it manually you can write a program for it and you can do it uh, yeah so this is how you actually map a uh, sky yeah i mean uh, and, you can also yeah, yeah you can also uh, like uh, invest in a go to system or build it yourself uh, so uh, this cost around at least in uh, indian rupees cost around 20000 so uh, you can uh, type out the latitude and longitude you want your radio dish to point it in and uh, then it automatically Uh, takes your antenna to that location, and then take your uh, maybe integration time of about one or two minutes is enough. Beautiful. So we have plotted the entire uh, spiral arm structure of Milky Way, uh, and the radial velocity curve as well. So uh, that you can definitely do. Uh, you just have to. uh make sure that uh you are doing the proper calculations uh, which uh, if you are willing to do will definitely guide you uh, so let us know about that if you are thank you very much sir we will uh, surely let you know thank you sir uh there's another question uh, in space we also have to consider about the relative velocity how to overcome that universe is also expanding solar system systems to also we don't know which fields to through the signal is passing by so how to get the minimum damage to the signal yeah so relative velocity is the whole uh, scenario in which we get information we get information majorityly because of this radi- uh, relative velocity we get, because of this relative velocity we get the doppler shifts in the signal and due to this doppler shift we get information about their relative uh, velocities and likewise distances and masses also uh, so the main thing is this particular relative velocity is the base we need this radio uh, relative velocity to abstract information from the universe right uh, it is not only the uh, antenna temperature or the signal strength but uh, it is the doppler shifts in the frequencies which actually give us the information and which is because of the relative velocity at the same time when you minimize uh, since it's uh, the signal is delicate as we have been talking about it to uh, improvise your reception you need amplifiers you need various electronic signal processing components um, no, uh, noise cancellation devices uh, in in the electronics you can correlate it so like rohan has already uh, you know uh, have been talking about this electronic devices which uh, minimizes your noise or uh, cuts off your noise and neutralizes your noise all throughout so that you can only get that particular signal delicate signal which you wish to receive from the universe uh, rohan you want to add something uh, yeah no uh, i think you explained it well uh, I, uh, so the part where we covered the uh, casopia a doppler shift uh, so the same answer uh, applies here thank you sir but uh, the another question is uh, what about magnetars can radio astronomy be used to detect gravitational waves from magnetars uh, uh, apparently gravitational wave is a different topic you yeah. need sophisticated in, uh, instruments like ligo uh, uh, i mean light interferometers to actually go through the gravitation wave uh, thing it's a totally different topic and it doesn't correlate with uh, the uh, radio astronomy part rohan you want to add something about it 
uh, yeah so as you uh, explained so gravitational waves are uh, completely different uh, form of waves they have uh, no almost no correlation with uh, electromagnetic uh, waves as such uh, so there is there are again uh, like in gravitational wave you have two polarizations like magnetic and electric field in gravitational wave they have the cross and uh, the plus sign wave uh, i think uh, you can understand it very well so those who want to uh, learn about ligo and gravitational waves there was a whole series started by uh, ayuka pune last uh, lockdown uh, so the link to that i'll put in the chat box right now and you can go through that so it was a gravitational so gw at home uh, was the name and uh, all eminent scientists uh, working in this field uh, they explained all uh, everything about ligo there is to know so uh, if you are interested in gravitational wave observatory uh, uh, definitely go through that yeah thank you very much sir and uh, one of our participants are asking if we start to make a radio telescope should it be situated on a remote area such as an empty land no need uh, no need at all uh, for a small telescope uh, uh, maybe to observe sun or basic hydrogen lines in the sky it is uh, good if you are away from a uh, city but in fact the uh, observations that uh, we took once uh, we were on a building which actually had the mobile tower uh, uh, like beside us so still there wasn't any issue uh, in receiving the signal so since you it all depends on the frequency that you are observing at uh, so if you are trying to uh, observe at uh, h1 which is 1420 megahertz so this mobile tower range of course there is a noise uh, but it shouldn't affect your, your calculations much yeah uh, uh, I, i would like to add uh, that uh, when you mention about a secluded land or a land which has lower radiation as compared to uh, the uh, other town or a metro uh, area definitely uh, for bigger telescopes or for delicate signals when you go on for a research base or a very delicate signal from the uh, universe then definitely it may be and your telescope may be much much bigger and uh, likewise you won't be you know investing in uh, uh, some place which is inside the main street you uh, mean metro street you will be secluded so that your big station or your big dish will be uh, you know working quite uh, nicely but uh, if you go on with a affordable small radio telescope or if you go on with a portable radio telescopes which we have we have illustrated then you, uh, there is no need if you uh, it, it's same as the observation you can correlate it using telescopes you have light pollutions likewise you have noise pollutions out here or electromagnetic pollutions out here so uh, to reduce the uh, light pollution you uh, go to some uh, secluded areas where there is no uh, township around uh so to reduce the noise you do the same but uh, definitely it will work almost the same in uh, the metro stations uh, uh, we didn't find any practical major changes for small telescopes but yes for large uh, uh, telescopes large uh, big big uh, uh, radio telescopes like uh, uh, 40 meter 10 meter dishes uh yes you need uh, something which is out uh, in the uh, which has lower radiations around you uh, specifically uh, as i said even a microwave oven can disrupt your signals so when you view a large frequency band 1420 you can view it anywhere yeah thank you sir uh, another question Uh, does satellite constellations space debris etc in uh, the orbits of the earth affect the radio, radio astronomy readings so uh, yes they do definitely uh, they uh, do affect readings only 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 if you are receiving at the same frequencies so these satellites are very restrictive in that uh, their nature 
they only transmit in their own frequencies they don't meddle with other frequencies so frequency is the key term out here if you receive in their a frequency range you will get huge amount of distortions uh due to the satellite signals but if if you receive at a different frequency which no satellite actually transmits in and which is specific uh, band for radio astronomy then yes you won't receive any distortion from the satellites you will straight away uh, get the signals from the universe so like 1420 we have been concentrated concentrating on this frequency 21 cm wavelength a lot because this is specific to its nature no satellite in the world actually transmits on 1420 so you can receive it any time of the day and you will get uh, specifically the universal signals only not the satellite signals uh, rohan you want to add yeah no i think uh, you have covered it thank you very much sir there's a uh, this is the last question uh, what are the advantages of using radio astronomy over uv extra x ray astronomy when detecting pulsars and nebulas since they give out x rays and uv spectra as well and is there a way of combining data from these different spectral ranges to get much detailed picture yeah so rohan let us get back to that uh, radio window part yeah yeah okay. if you can present albert yes well. here you can clearly see that the extra uh, x rays ultraviolet rays are blocked by upper atmosphere so you cannot view them right in a, a observatory or something but uh, if you go on with the radio uh, wave observable part you have the radio window so you can even receive it right from uh, you know uh, sitting out here uh, 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 you know on earth actually and you don't need information from satellites uh, relaying uh, their observations so uh, it's much more dynamic and much more easily available to you so this is the major advantage this is the biggest advantage i would say for uh, radio reception uh, specifically for these kinds of um, uh, you know stars or pulsars which actually transmit x ray and ultraviolet as well as radio so you always go with radio because it's easily available to you and you can do much more faster research on it rather than going to x ray and ultraviolet you can get x ray and ultraviolet but uh, you need to you know launch a satellite and this so uh, yeah that way anything rohan you want to add uh, yeah so uh, uh, this is a, a good question so actually astronomers uh, do exactly uh, what you mentioned about uh, they take data uh, uh, in all of uh, electromagnetic spectrum available and then they uh, study it uh, in different wavelengths and uh, then it is even combined if that is possible so uh, uh, there is no such advantage you can talk about there is just that there is an additional information in every uh, spectrum that you will get so uh, since we already spoke that visible light and uh, radio waves are observable from earth so that is why we do that uh, from ground itself and uh, then for uh, other spectrums you have to uh, launch it in space and uh, view it so that way uh, you get a, a very very detailed picture once you observe in all uh, spectrums so uh, there is even a, a whole a school dedicated to this currently that uh, i am uh, like we are starting uh, which is a growth caltech school uh, uh, so growth stands for global relay of observations uh, making transients happen uh, watching transients happen so uh, this is what they do uh, they observe uh, in all uh, of uh, the spectrum and then they combine data to study uh, so the school is actually up on youtube you can search it it was held in uh, iit bombay in 2018 and uh, 2020 was held uh, online so all lectures even the python notebooks are there online so you can uh, definitely it will help you study uh, more yeah
Thank you, sir. And that will be all the questions for the Q&A session. Again, thank you very much for the experiences and the knowledge you shared with us today. The word of thanks will be delivered by Kinuri Abhayavikrama. Over to you, Kinuri. Thank you. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. I deem it a great honor to propose the word of thanks to all who have helped help us in making this webinar a memorable day. I personally learned so many new things on radio astronomy. I would like to give my heartiest gratitude to our guest speakers of the introduction to radio astronomy. Session, Mr. Ankit Sharma and Mr. Rohan Sangai for praising us with their presence and for sharing their valuable knowledge and experience with us here today. So, Thank you once again, Mr. Ankit Sharma and Mr. Rohan Sangai. I would yeah. like to thank SETS SLTC for helping us to conduct this event successfully. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to make this event a success. Also, I owe my special thanks to the organizing committee members for their enormous dedication to organize this valuable and educational event. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for joining with us today. We hope you found this webinar very useful. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Kinyuri Abhay Vikram. So this concludes, uh, con concludes the webinar. Thank you so much for attending. We hope you learned and enjoyed the session. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I hope uh, you have been able to uh, learn a few things from this. And uh, if you have more interest and would like to uh, know more things, uh, uh, you can definitely contact me or Ankit Bhaiya uh, and we'll be happy to answer your queries. So uh, I'll just type out my email ID uh, in case you want any further resources. So I have already, uh, I think, uh, put out the link for the PPT and uh, all resources are given there. But uh, still, if you would like to know more, uh, I've put in my email ID and you can definitely mail me and we can have a, a discussion. Yeah. So thank you, SCDS. Uh, it was a great pleasure uh, to hold this uh, webinar with you, uh, Ankit Baya, if you would like to add. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you, everyone. So uh, thank you everyone uh, from my side also for giving this opportunity. Majority of the part is covered by uh, Rohan itself. Thanks a lot.